Okay, I'm back with the next video in this series. We're looking at chapter two on the web. This is just meant to be a short, quick lecture going along with the content for this week. So we left off talking about top level domains like .com, .edu, .gov, things like that. And you can see him there, here they're listed in the book. But they can also be, there's top level domains for countries. So I have a Wikipedia page here, country code for top level domains just at wikipedia.org, and you can see some here. So they've got uh, albania.al, armenia.am, right? And they have a whole listing here of various countries and the country codes, .cn for China, .co for Colombia. So a top-level domain name can be, the most familiar one is .com, but it can also be a country code as well, uh, or country top-level domain. If you're interested more about domain names, I recommend you go to Wikipedia and check out the entry on domain names and the DNS system. So, I mean, this is a this is pretty interesting stuff. Uh, DNS, the domain name system, is pretty interesting for me because basically what it does is it maps names to IP addresses so that we can search for things over networks by name, and then it takes us to the relevant IP address. You've got the history here of DNS and top-level domains on Wikipedia, and it's pretty interesting stuff, right? The, um, so, for instance, if I open up a command prompt here, so I'll open up a command prompt, and I'm trying to rebuild my website for Dan's courses. So what I could do is I could say nslookup from the command prompt and say name server lookup right use my name server and look up um, Dan's courses.com and it should go out uh, map the domain name to its IP address and tell me what IP address my website's located at or basically which is where my web host is so you can see here Dan's courses.com is at this IP address so if you put that into the browser the your computer the dns client on your computer that goes to the dns server and says what is the ip address for danscourses.com and the dns server responds with the ip address and then you go there so that's what happens when you put in a name unless it's cached unless the, the page is cached which in this case it's cached so it didn't actually go out there it used the cached page and so it actually didn't ask the dns server so in that case right okay bummer but that's what i have firefox here for because it does not re retain its history i set the settings in firefox to not save history so every time i go to a page like danscourses.com it has to go out to dns and find it and you can see there it is Dan's courses new website coming soon so let's talk more about, let's just kind of zip through this. So internet standards, the IETF, this is another um, group that basically takes care of the, inter the internet standards for the rules and the protocols and everything. And I recommend just doing a search on Google and going to their website. The World Wide Web Consortium, it's a bunch of organizations together to come up with World Wide Web standards for new technologies like JavaScript and changes to JavaScript and all kinds of languages, CSS, HTML. So if you go to the World Wide Web Consortium, they have great tutorials on HTML, CSS, JavaScript, you name it. All right, moving on, websites and web pages. This is basic concepts, once again, that we're talking about here. Um, most of you are familiar with websites, different types of websites, you know, the difference between a blog, right, versus a content aggregator like a news site or something like that. And, but then, that, once again, this is good reading though, right? Uh, media sharing sites like YouTube, social network sites like Facebook. All right, moving on. The pros and cons of web apps, okay? So web apps, okay, so this is, um, I think in the context we're talking about here, 
is applications hosted by a cloud service provider. So for instance, you can use Microsoft Office in the cloud by using Microsoft Word through the web browser. Uh, one of the ones that uh, people are used to using all the time is Google Docs, right? So if I go to my uh, Gmail account and I can go to Google Docs and I can create a um, word processing document right through my web browser. So that's what they're talking about here. Now, usually the pros is that you can get to those apps anywhere, like Google Docs, right? Google Sheets, um, also Microsoft Office 365, Excel, Word, stuff like that. However, you're not getting the full version of the software, right? It's different than if you downloaded the software Microsoft Office to your computer and get the rich version of the software. Now in our class, you are going to have to use and download Office 365 to your computer and install it to your computer. In other words, using the cloud app, right? Using the web app for Microsoft Word or Excel won't be sufficient for the assignments that we'll be doing in a few weeks. So we'll be, I'll, I'll go over how to get it installed on your computer. All right, the major components of a web page, right here you can see here the header area, the logo, the nav bar, a sidebar, the body, and the footer, right? So the parts of a web page, right? So this is, this is interesting. Um, the other thing that you could do to see these areas is you could actually just look at your source code and try to identify the HTML in your source code. And we're going to do that in a little bit too. So these are the sections, the major sections of a web page, right? So in other words, if I right click and say, um, I want to look at the source. However, this is not the right page to do it with. So let's say, let's say I go to Wikipedia and I say, I want to see the page source. Okay. So this is the HTML, the code behind the web page. Okay. And you can see right here, there's the beginning of the head area right here. And there's the end of the head area right there. Hopefully you can kind of see that. Maybe I can zoom in a little bit. Yeah. So this is the beginning tag. We're talking about an HTML web page. There's the beginning of the head area, right? And then we scroll down. There's the, the, the end of the head area. Here's the beginning of the body of the page, right? And then, right, we're going to have different things like navigation, right? Different separated areas inside the page, right? Um, and these are done with tags. So you can see here different tags. This is a div tag, div tag, etc. Let me um, zoom out and go here. And we can scroll towards the bottom, right? And you can see there, there's the end of the footer area. And if we scroll up a little bit, we'll see the beginning of the footer area, right? So this is the portions of the web page. Now there's a lot of stuff going on in the background. So, you know, this is hard to read, right? These tags and this code, it's very hard to read. And so that's why the page actually just gets rendered by your web browser to look like this. All right, moving on. All right, identifying secure and insecure websites. We've already talked about that. So HTTP, is insecure that means it's an insecure web page https means it's a secured web page and it's talking about that right here it's talking about the concepts that i mentioned in the previous video about a digital certificate right that you can you can now in the old days you had to purchase a digital certificate to secure your site but today if you have a web hosting account it's a lot easier. They usually will give you a security certificate to go with your website and to go with your domain name and your website um, from the get-go, right? Speaking of domain names, have you ever tried going to a domain name registrar, like here's one, namecheap.com, which is my favorite um, domain name registrar because maybe I'm a cheapskate or something. But then you could put in your name here and see, you know, is your... 
is that website available for you based on your name or your business? And you could put in the search here to see, right? You could say here, uh, uh, coolideas.com for commercial because I'm going to make this a business, right? And then I say search and it says coolideas.com, right? This is such a good domain name. Uh, somebody owns it and they'll sell it to you instead of $15 a year, which is what it should cost, $49,999 a year for coolideas.com. Okay. Um, however, if you did coolideas.cool, it would just be $5 a year, right? So, <laughs> so you can see here, this is what we call uh, domain name squatting, right? So somebody purchased this domain name and hopes to sell it maybe, right? So uh, something like that. Right. You could put in your name, you could do all kinds of stuff, but just to see like, hey, is that name that I'm thinking of for my business um, available? And for your website, if you're thinking about making a commercial website, you want a name that has something about what the site is about in the name, right? So if you're, you know, if you're, uh, if your commercial business is about photography, then you might want something with the word photo or photography or pictures or images, something in there um, that identifies, you know, that makes that, that name, that domain name more meaningful. Anyway, you should give that a try. All right, we're moving on here. That's again, this is just a quick, a quick introduction. So use of e-commerce. So e-commerce websites, um, when I think of e-commerce, everybody thinks of Amazon, right, with the most successful, but there's also other e-commerce websites that are out there. You know, today you can purchase goods everywhere, right? Every company that has um, uh, brick and mortar stores typically also sells on the web, right? So you have um, business to consumer, B2C, consumer to consumer, where this occurs when one consumer sells directly to another. So this would be like, I would think consumer to consumer would be like eBay, right? Business to consumer would be like, you know, maybe Target's website or something like that. Or business to business where one uh, business is selling to another. All right. And then it goes into the roles of e-commerce in daily life. This is something that, you know, the pros and cons. Like I said, the reading is actually pretty good. It's very introductory, but um, the concepts are interesting. Um, the use of e-commerce in business transactions, right? Having an electric storefront and then the ideas of cookies, right? So are cookies a security risk? Many people would tell you that yes, cookies are a security risk. I would say that cookies is just a little bit of text that is saved to your computer that helps the website identify you know, basically where you were on that website, right? What section you were in, what pages you've looked at. It allows you to identify yourself. Also, cookies are used not as, um, also as a means of securing yourself. So you can have cookies that have basically session IDs and things that identify you, tokens that um, are supposed to secure you and, and make you um, more secure as you visit that website. Now, you know, if somebody intercepts the cookies and gets your session ID or something like that, then they could impersonate you. So there is that, um, there is that, that part of it. Um, so, uh, yeah, so there isn't, there, nothing is purely secure. You know, the web, as you're browsing the web is a wild place. You're saying, Hey, take me to these servers and show me these web pages. You're basically taking yourself to other computers and there's inherent risk involved in that. So, but it helps to have HTTPS. It helps to have verified websites, having Google verify your searches that yes, this website is legitimate, that the DNS system verifies that this is, this website is who you say it is. When you go to your bank, right? You want to know I'm actually at the bank. Um, that's what um, is the next topic, e-commerce payments, right? Securing credit, credit card transactions and transport layer security. 
So right now, TLS is at version 1.2. Uh, that's the version that we're using. Your web browser will not let you use version 1.1 or 1.0, right? So Google Chrome will not allow me to use insecure versions of transport layer security. So, so that's that that's helpful, right? So the browsers help help to make that happen. All right, finding e-commerce deals and information literacy skills to web searches. So advanced web searches is the next topic, but I'll have to post that in my next video.